I'm Greg Dalton. I'm Ariana Brocious. And this is Climate One. This week, we're checking in on the impact of the largest U.S. climate bill ever passed, the Inflation Reduction Act. Let's back up for a minute. You'll probably remember that in August 2022, Congress passed a bill intended to jumpstart our transition to a clean energy economy. And a lot of other things, but today we're focused on the energy and climate aspects. The IRA was a huge bill with many tax incentives for investors, manufacturers, business owners, and homeowners. About $400 billion over 10 years for the energy parts. The legislation was trying to do two things. One, push mature clean energy technologies further into the mainstream. So think solar panels, electric cars, batteries. And it's also supposed to help emerging technologies. This is things like green hydrogen, carbon capture, and sustainable aviation fuel get more fully developed so they can be useful in curbing carbon emissions down the line. There's something in this for everybody, big industrial companies and small growth companies. Notably, most of the benefits are focused on tax incentives for individuals and companies that choose to do things. So it's not a big regulatory stick forcing anyone to do anything. It's only been about 20 months since the bill passed. And of course, an effort as massive as shifting the way we power our country is going to take some time. But it's still worth checking in to see how much the law has done so far and what direction we're headed. On today's show, we'll hear from a think tank analyst, a climate justice advocate, and a clean energy investor on how they grade the Inflation Reduction Act's progress so far. And it's not all glowing reviews. Right. One of the major criticisms of the IRA was that the law continues to support fossil fuels. And that was by design. The design of West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, a Democrat with deep ties to the fossil fuel industry. He was instrumental in writing the bill and getting it passed after he blocked President Biden's Build Back Better bill because he thought it cost too much. But Manchin says he was ready to support new green energy technologies, as long as they also aligned with the goals of his constituents. I didn't think this administration was committed to fossil production, so we weren't getting leases done. We couldn't get production done. So I made sure when we wrote the bill that basically you're not going to put a wind farm or, or a, um, a, f- a solar farm on BLM lands or in territorial waters unless we're extracting the minerals we have under our feet. So they, had, they can't do one without the other, and that's why we have a balanced approach. That's Manchin back in March, speaking at Sarah Week by S&P Global, a major oil and gas conference. He explained that as he sees it, the IRA was designed to ensure U.S. energy security. And he pointed to record domestic oil and gas production as proof of its success. It was done basically so the United States of America could have the energy we need to be uh, energy independent, provide energy for our, for our uh, allies across the pond, and be able to invest in the technology for the energy of the future. A lot of climate people villainize Joe Manchin, think he's the devil. After all, he does represent coal country, but that's his job. And he did get this big bill passed. That's a good thing. And that's how change happens. It can be messy and full of compromise. And it's a way forward. The IRA includes policies favored by the fossil fuel industry and Republicans. That does give the IRA broad support. For example, I heard the CEO of a major U.S. oil company praise it at the U.N. climate conference in Dubai last year. It's a little bit like Obamacare. People like the policies in it, even if they may bash the law and the president who signed it. And there's an important way the IRA differs from other climate legislation that came before it. I talked about that with Trevor Hauser, partner at the Rhodium Group, an independent think tank that focuses on the transition from fossil to clean energy. So the last time there was a big push in Congress to pass large-scale climate legislation was in 2010 beginning of the Obama administration, and that was in the form of a cap and trade system. So the way that operated is you put a price of carbon on the kind of emissions and energy system activity you're trying to discourage. So if you're burning coal in a power plant, if you're burning natural gas in a house, if you're burning oil in a car, there's an additional tax that put on that to try to discourage that activity. That legislation did not pass. It passed the House of Representatives and it didn't pass the Senate. And that was the waxman Markey. That was the waxman Markey bill, exactly. So the Biden administration, kind of learning from that history, decided to take a different approach, which was instead of trying to make dirty energy more expensive, they decided to make clean energy cheaper. That would be a more politically palatable approach. 
and using the types of mechanisms that were already in place for different types of technologies, grants, loans, tax credits, but really supercharging those programs and expanding their scope. And so what the Inflation Reduction Act does is it makes a wide range of clean energy technologies and transportation sources much cheaper. And it effectively makes them cost competitive with fossil fuels almost everywhere in the country and in almost all applications. So carrots instead of sticks this time. Carrots instead of sticks. The Rhodium Group has been tracking clean energy investment throughout the economy in collaboration with MIT. A few months ago, they released a sort of IRA progress report that shows how different projections of the law's impact actually stack up against what's happened so far. And what we found is that overall, the IRA is working largely as expected. The pace of deployment of clean energy technology is accelerating dramatically. Last year, there was $239 billion of investment in clean energy technologies throughout the economy, up 38% year on year, double the uh, pace just a few years ago. Within that, there's some technologies and sectors that are doing a little bit better than expected and some that are doing a little bit worse than expected. But by and large, the legislation is operating consistent with what was expected. So it's doing what it was intended to so far. It's doing what so far it's doing in, in broad strokes, it's doing what it was intended to do, which is using public dollars in the form of tax credits and grants and loans to attract private investment into clean energy technology and to accelerate the sales of that technology by making it cheaper for consumers. So if you look at fiscal year 2023, we estimate that there was $220 billion in total investment in clean energy across the country. Of that, only $34 billion was taxpayer funded. Wow. So one thing that we've been following on Climate One is the recent surge of electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles and battery factories that have been popping up all over the U.S. There's this new so-called you know, battery belt. So how has the IRA impacted the manufacturing and clean energy supply chain for electric vehicles and batteries here in the U.S.? It's been pretty transformative. So the IRA provides tax credits for manufacturers of critical minerals, of battery component materials, of battery cell and module assembly. Uh, So the whole electric vehicle supply chain can receive incentives under the IRA. And we have seen really explosive growth in clean energy manufacturing in the U.S., largely as a result of that legislation. So over the past two years, there's been $156 billion in new investments in manufacturing announced in the U.S., and that's a 165% increase over the two years before that. So we're really seeing a dramatic amount of investment in manufacturing and in places that I think people were skeptical there would ever be U.S. manufacturing. And so there's this manufacturing side, but then there's also the consumer side. And there were provisions in the IRA that give tax credits to average people who want to buy electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles up to $7,500 for a brand new vehicle, I think 4000 maybe for a used vehicle. Yep. But those had some specific restrictions about where those vehicle components were made, if they were U.S. made and so forth. So it did actually limit that pool of what was eligible. So as you take a look back at the EV market, how did that all shake out? So there were, before the IRA, there were tax credits for electric vehicles, but they were limited to the first 200,000 vehicles that any manufacturer sold. So like the biggest producers of EVs, Tesla, GM, buyers of those vehicles were no longer able to take claim tax credits. Right. So what the IRA did is it, extended that. So that $7,500 tax credit is now available for any manufacturer for the purchase of those vehicles. But as you noted, there's some new restrictions. One is income-based. And then the second set of restrictions are around the content in the battery itself. So whether the battery assembly happens in North America and whether the critical minerals that go into the battery come from either North America or a country with which the U.S. has a free trade agreement. There have been reports that EV sales are declining or that there's sort of a, you know, a lull, but actually your report shows that they're doing well, right? Better than expected. Yeah. So last year, EV sales grew by 52% year on year and accounted for 9.2% of all passenger vehicles sold. 
in the U.S. And that's up from just 2% a few years ago. So the growth has been really dramatic. That's a big jump. A lot of what the news reporting is focusing on is that the pace of sales growth is starting to slow. That doesn't mean total sales are declining. It means the, that really rapid pace of growth is going to slow down. And that is normal and expected. And one thing I'm wondering about here is whether, and this is sort of more speculation, but you know, there's sort of a um, psychological role that some of these incentives play because I was interested in getting an electric vehicle, looked at the incentives, ended up getting a vehicle that was used, did not qualify for the the credit. So I'm not actually taking advantage of it, but it was kind of like there was a lot of momentum. You know, I was seeing more of them around my neighborhood and whatever. There was more talk about them in the news. And so I wonder if that also has some effect, though it's not um, actually a financial impact. Yeah, part of the goal with these incentives for the early deployment of technologies is you want to get enough of them into the market to normalize the technology and to dissuade concerns, right? And you can see this with electric vehicles. I mean, we've driven electric vehicles since 2015 in our household, and, you know, each generation of cars gets better and better. And as anyone who's driven an EV knows, they are incredibly fast. The acceleration beats any gasoline car by a mile. And when people start to experience the performance benefits of EVs, plus the convenience that for 360 days out of 365 days a year, you're just charging by plugging it in your house overnight and never have right. to go to a gas station. Once people experience that convenience, it broadens the appetite and market for the technology. Mm hmm. Okay, so we've talked a bit about some of the consumer incentives, but where are we at with utility scale electric generation and how has that industry or those those sectors benefited from the IRA? Yeah, so we had a record year in 2023, almost 33 gigawatts of new utility scale clean electricity generation and storage was added and the pace of growth in Wind and solar and storage has been accelerated by the Inflation Reduction Act. We're coming in at the lower end of the range of what was expected by dollars for the IRA. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First, high interest rates mm -hmm. hit clean energy particularly hard because all of the cost of a clean energy facility, like think about a wind farm. All of the cost of that is the capital. It's the equipment that you're installing. Upfront. Compared to, right, upfront. Compared to like a natural gas power plant where a lot of the cost is just the natural gas you're buying on an ongoing basis to operate it. So when interest rates rise, it creates particularly strong headwinds for renewable electricity. Second, renewable electricity has to be moved from where the resource is to where the demand is. So if you think back to the power system we've had in the past, you moved the fuel to where customers were, right? So you'd build a natural gas plant near a city, mm -hmm. and then you would move the natural gas to that plant and burn it there. So, but you didn't have to transport the electricity that far. With wind and solar, you can't move the wind and you can't move the sun, right? So you need to generate it where those resources are best. And then you have to move the electricity to where demand is. And so while the cost of building a wind farm is quite low now, with the exception of the high interest rates over the past year or two, you also have to invest in transmission lines to connect that electricity to the market. Well, there's no cost barrier to building those transmission lines. It does require getting permitting approvals for the full distance that a transmission line has to go through. And sometimes you have individual communities that are opposed to having a transmission line routed through their community uh, or don't want the wind farm sited in a place where they can see it. And so renewables compared to fossil fuel is a little bit more vulnerable to these types of non-cost barriers mm -hmm. of delays in siting and permitting and transmission construction. And some of this is simply because they are newer and, you know, these coal and gas plants in many cases have been in communities forever and they have their own share of downsides of pollution, air pollution, noise, so forth. But maybe it's just become embedded in the fabric of life, whereas a new wind farm going up in your farming community can be a more visually 
distracting thing. So that's a useful frame. So think about if I'm going to, if I want to build an offshore wind project off of Mm -hmm. Cape Cod in Massachusetts, right? That is going to allow a coal or natural gas fire power plant to shut down. Mm -hmm. And the shutdown of that coal and natural gas fire power plant is going to have huge public health benefits for the communities that live around that power plant. But the people who live along the coast in Cape Cod that are upset that there might be a wind turbine in their view, they're not the ones who live near the coal-fired power plant. And so the challenge for policymakers is figuring out how to navigate those issues in a way that is the best for everybody involved, even if it means it's certain people who's out in the process. Yeah. And this is a super critical part of this transition, you know, because there has been a very unjust distribution of power generation and siting thus far. A lot of the communities where those power plants exist now are bearing the brunt of that pollution. So there was a focus of some of this legislation to really target certain communities that have been disproportionately impacted. So of the $118 billion in federal programs in the law, 40% of the benefits are required to go to disadvantaged communities. Can you tell me a little bit about how the implementation of those programs has gone so far? So looking at the first year, low-income communities account for about 38 39% of the U.S. population, if you're looking at a census track level. And... 41% of clean investment went to those communities. So they received a larger share of total investment than their share of the population. It's even more impressive for energy communities. Energy communities account for 18.5% of the total population, but they received 37% of total investment uh, in the first year following uh, following the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's it's working as intended so far. Yeah, so far, the communities that policymakers were most focused on helping are receiving an outsized share of the investment under the IRA. The major goal of the Inflation Reduction Act is to reduce emissions, and the act seeks to accomplish a 40 percent reduction by the year 2030. Taking a look now, how are we doing on that ultimate goal of emissions reductions? If we look at the pace of progress in 2023, it looks just from that year that, you know, we're certainly on track to come in on that range. But if the pace of utility scale clean electricity investment does not increase meaningfully over the next couple of years, then we'd likely fall a little bit short of that 40% reduction. We would come in, you know, more in the 30s range. To get to a 40% reduction, let alone a 50 to 52% reduction, we need to dramatically expand the amount of wind and solar and storage and other clean electricity technologies like geothermal that we're adding to the grid each year. The good news is that the cost of those technologies is very cheap, thanks to the IRA. The challenge is, can we build it fast enough? Can we train the labor source needed? Can we mobilize supply chains? And can we expedite permitting processes so that those plants can can build in in the timeline needed? Trevor Hauser is a partner at Rhodium Group. Thank you very much for joining us on Climate One. Thanks, Ariana. When a fossil fuel plant closes, the sky's clear, but whole communities can be left behind. President Biden's climate agenda is supposed to address that too, with job opportunities and direct investment. Coming up, How are those programs going? I think where this kind of project sort of missed the mark is creating opportunities even for tribal nations to change their economic base. Where the IRA is coming up short. That's up next when Climate One continues. Please help us get people talking more about climate by sharing this episode with a friend. And we'd also love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a rating or review right now from your device. Thanks. Hey, Climate One fans, we have some exciting news. We are now on Patreon. That means that you, as a subscriber, can get access to Climate One episodes free of ads interrupting your listening experience. For just $5 a month, your Patreon membership also gets you access to our Climate One Discord channel, where you can discuss the episode with other Climate One fans 
and begin to build your own climate community. Best of all, your support makes future Climate One episodes possible. Join us today at patreon.com slash climate one. This hour, we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. It allocated $400 billion for climate-friendly initiatives, and a big chunk of that money is supposed to go to places that have been supported by or disproportionately hurt by fossil fuel production. Now it's been about a year and a half since the bill passed, and we're checking in. Are the promises of the IRA being fulfilled in those places? Benishi Albert is an indigenous leader from Oklahoma of the Yuchi and Anishinaabe peoples. She's a longtime climate and environmental justice organizer and recently served as co-director of Climate Justice Alliance. I asked her to give me her sense of how the Inflation Reduction Act is playing out for communities she serves. Legislation like that is, you know, there's the hype at the beginning and then there's the implementation, right? Mm -hmm. And the cogs of implementation move incredibly slow. So, you know, I think there's still yet to be seen some of the like real output and outcomes of it. But there are some pieces being implemented for sure. But, you know, it's a slow process with the governments, like trying to get the Titanic to turn on a dime. Right. And some of that's by design, the way our government was designed, a lot of rules to be written, et cetera, a lot of money moving, want to make sure that it goes in the right way to the right places. What are the bright spots that you see of things that are happening? What's what's happening well in your view? You know, we were always optimistic about some of the the funds that were addressing some harms that had happened in some communities, but also around, you know, some of the funds that were reducing different kind of emissions. But even in those funds, it's like my grandma would say, it's the salt with the sugar, Mm -hmm. right? There are some that are investing in reducing diesel emissions. Absolutely great. Reducing emissions through forestation can be a little tricky and nuanced, particularly as it impacts the communities surrounding those forests. So you mentioned things are just starting to move and moving slowly, and yet climate is seen as this urgent crisis. We got to move quickly. So how does that make you feel with like, oh, it's going slow, but everyone's saying we got to go faster, faster. And sometimes that can be at tension with tribal consultation and community input. Yeah, absolutely. And how how do we ensure that these resources actually get to community and not just to industry who are in community, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of these are still accessible to oil and gas companies, and some of them are primarily directed to oil and gas companies. And so it's both, you know, the things that we're looking forward to that would be helpful, like around some of the rebate programs, some stuff around rural electric. But even in the rural electric, like some of the language, oil and gas corporations can say, oh, we're doing that work. By bringing methane gas, you know, electricity b- built from methane yeah. gas, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And, it, it, you know, some of, those, some of those projects also, you know, allow for some initiatives that are really not getting us to the benchmark that we need to. People use the term false solutions, or I call them climate scams. Like it says we're reducing emissions, but it's also a way to just allow the industry to keep producing if they can say they're doing offsets in other ways, right? Yeah, and those are always a little squishy and murky. Yeah, Yeah. they're murky Mm -hmm. and they, they continue to contribute to the problem, right? So if you have, you know, a climate scam where it says, oh, we're going to do emissions in this rural agriculture kind of project, but you're still producing the megatons of carbon emissions, then we will never meet our mark, right? We will, we will always fall short of meeting the, the carbon reduction marks that we need to if we're still producing at the levels that the U.S. and other countries have always produced. And so that, I think that was the missed opportunity with the IRA. You know, how can we include not just the funds and the programs, but how can we include how we're going to phase out coal or how we're going to phase out, you know, producing energy in this kind of way that produces carbon. And instead, we have these programs in the IRA, which basically say, okay, you can still produce as long as you 
invest in these offsets or invest in these programs that, you know, you can reduce carbon in other ways. Right. So it sounds like you're saying that the programs are adding renewables, but not really shrinking the core problem of fossil fuels. Yeah. Both can happen, right? Yeah. The IRA contains over $700 million for tribal-specific programs like tribal electrification, climate resilience. Can you speak to any specifics about where that is happening? My most recent work with Climate Justice Alliance included lots of communities, not just tribal communities. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like there are a number of tribes who are like trying to think through what does that mean? What does the resiliency mean? And I think where this kind of project sort of missed the mark is creating opportunities even for tribal nations to change their economic base. I mean, I'm based in Oklahoma, right? And, you know, Oklahoma as a whole state, its identity and economy is based on oil and gas extraction. Mm -hmm. So, for example... In Oklahoma, you know, we have special fees. If you want to do residential solar on your home, you have to pay extra fees to have that. It's almost like a tax to have solar. Wow. Taxing the sun. That's the kind of thing that, yeah. So that's the kind of government that we have here in Oklahoma. And so it's 39 tribes here. They all have oil and gas leases, right? And so it's an economic base for them. And you know, even though I have very strong feelings about that kind of extraction and what it means, it also means that those tribal nations are able to take care of their their nations, right? And so if we're not providing a sort of economic opportunity for tribes to like shift their economic development away from fossil fuel extraction, then you're you're just pitting them to like continue to support it. That's interesting because I often think, you know, fossil fuels often hurt communities of color, turn them off, and people of color will benefit. And you're saying, oh, it's more complicated than that. There's actually quite a complicated relationship and even dependence with tribes and communities on fossil fuels. Yeah. So turning it off today is not, it ain't that easy or that simple. Yeah. I mean, definitely, I'm an advocate of keep it in the ground. Like that will always be my point of reference. But I'm also not going to demonize tribes for taking care of their people. I will push against the economic system that we have as a nation that relies pretty heavily on fossil fuel extraction, right? Our whole country is based on, on that. Our, our history, you know, the, the oil boom built the economic wealth that we have in this country. And I live in a state who have, you know, professional sports teams called the oilers and the drillers. We have national sports teams who are called the oils and, mm -hmm. and the drillers. Mm -hmm. and so. But we have to create more sort of economic opportunities. And, you know, that was one of the missed opportunities with the IRA is, yes, there's lots of funds here, but a, a much of it was still funding the existing oil and gas infrastructure and doubling down on some even. And then, you know, there was some investment into some other pieces that are also, you know, kind of scary when you think about it. So, you know, the investment into nuclear yeah, the IRA has a little bit for everybody. There's hydrogen, there's nuclear, there's like every, something for everybody. And that, you know, there's some of that uh, was needed to be in there to get the votes. Justice 40 is an initiative of the Biden administration that's meant to direct 40 percent of the overall benefits of federal investments to disadvantaged communities. Many of the elements in the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, big climate bill and health care bill also fall within that initiative of Justice 40. How's that working out? Is it meeting its expectations? Is money going to the places you think it should go to? I think there are some places where that's happening well. There are some places where community voices, even EJ voices, are giving input into what Justice 40 can be. When I was with Climate Justice Alliance, you know, we helped engage communities to talk to the, the WEJAC, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. Uh, about their input about Justice 40, uh, but also their input in other areas, you know, like CCS, and hydrogen. and Carbon capture and sequestration. Yeah. And that White House group was a big deal when it was created. It's like, this is the first time we have this group at the White House level advising on climate justice and environmental justice. And I think they get it and they're giving their input and advice. 
and their purpose was to give input and advice to the to the White House about what should be done. And so I think that was definitely a opportunity to like engage communities. But then what happens to that those reports and advice, right? I heard a term recently from the activist Kumi Naidu, who talked about handshake activism. And he said he learned that, you know, access doesn't mean influence. Getting a photo or getting a report to the White House doesn't mean that the White House listens or acts, acts upon that, in, that consultation and that input. Oh, right? yeah. Doesn't... <laughs> because even, even with tribal nations, like you have that act of consultation, which means I've just discussed with you. Consultation doesn't mean I have to do what you say. Yeah. So a lot of tribal nations now have been engaging also in this term of consent. Prior consent. We yeah, free, yeah. prior, mm-hmm. informed consent. It's like, yes, you can't just do consultation. You have to also engage to say, yes, do we want this or no? Do we not want this? Tribal nations are pushing that. And I think that kind of consent should also be for communities to say, we don't want this. This is not what we're signing up for. Last time you were on the show, you said that President Biden should declare a climate emergency. I haven't heard about that as much lately. There was some reporting from e e News and others that the administration seriously considered declaring a climate national emergency. And then the Inflation Reduction Act passed. And I was like, OK, we don't need to do that because now this is legislation. What's your reaction to that? Do you still think that the declaration would be helpful? I have mixed feelings about the climate emergency now. And and for a couple of reasons. Hmm. One, I absolutely think that the Biden administration, the world governments in general, need to move with the urgency of emergency, right? Like they need to move with that kind of haste. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. not what we're seeing. And so that part, I'm, I 100%, you know, will double down on that. The actual enactment of a climate emergency you know, I, I started thinking about like, what are the what what gets implemented if that happens? You know, like me asking for a climate emergency was, you know, I want the government to move like their pants are on fire. Right. That's what I want. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But when I think about the history of a state of emergency being declared in this country for any other acts, like would that be the same for climate emergency? And in those situations, I worry then about communities of color, right? Well, I, th- I think of Japanese internment, right? Yeah. That's one thing that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I worry about communities of color and what does it mean for an emergency to be declared, for the military to be engaged? You know, does that mean that there's a engagement of martial law? And then mm-hmm. the, I, I, I don't know. These are questions I honestly don't know. But I was started thinking through some of these questions of what does it actually mean to implement in policy and in practice a state of emergency? Biden is losing voters of color. Can you see why? Absolutely. I mean, there are communities of color are are really pushing for we need immediate relief now, both in environmental issues and social issues and and funding for a number of different programs and are just not seeing that investment and are really, you know, had some hopefulness in the previous election. Like, all right, this is this is the champion. And now a lot of folks are like, you know, the two party system, neither of the parties are looking out for our best interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, it becomes are they just invested in the health and well-being of corporations of the econo- of our current economic system. And even though I, you know, I want to see a shift in our economic system, I'm very clear, you know, what the impacts of the poorest of the poor and a shift in the economic system, right? And, you know, climate is not a leading message of the Biden campaign in this season. What would you say to the Biden camp from your perspective as a leader? on climate justice? I mean, I would say if your term is coming to an end and you may or may not be elected going forward, then go out with a big bang, do something big on climate and just be like, this is it. This is my legacy. And instead, the legacy is pretty ho-hum when it comes to climate, you know? 
But to be fair, I mean, you know, the, he got through historic investments, the IRA, the Inf Infrastructure Act, the CHIPS Act. It's not enough. Yeah. But, you know, his, his climate wins are not trivial. They are significant and historic. They're significant. They're historic. But it was like, yeah, but we didn't have anything before. So <laughs> compared, compared to nothing, to nothing yes, no. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's great. It's phenomenal. But it doesn't mean that I don't still expect more from the administration and from any administration. I mean, regardless of how I vote, I'm holding whoever's feet to the fire to make sure they do this because I need my government and world governments to act like their pants are on fire and to move in that urgency. Because if we don't change how we are moving forward, even in the next five to 10 years, we're, yeah, yeah. we're coming to there's no turning back. There's no fixing. You know, we're, we're very close to that tipping point. Benishi Albert, thank you so much for sharing your insights on Climate One. Thank you. Communities across the country are trying to protect themselves from the impacts of climate change. Everything from shoring up coastlines to raising roads. And that's expensive. The IRA and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill aim to send tens of billions of federal dollars to help, but actually getting that money can be very difficult. Now we're going to go to a small island off the coast of Georgia, not far from Savannah. Emily Jones of WABE and Grist has this report. Tybee Island has a rain problem. So all the storm water drains into here. I'll show you this. Tybee resident and consultant Alan Robertson drives a golf cart to a spot on the beach at the southern tip of the island, where the water is supposed to come out. So the city has to clear this every day. The pipe is buried by sand. The pipe's under there. <laughs> you can't see it, but there. So what happens is, if it, when it gets covered with sand and the tide rises, there's nowhere for the stormwater to go. The water backs up in the system and wells up out of the drains, flooding the roads. This is a problem we're working on. Tybee's not alone. All over Georgia, old stormwater systems struggle to keep up with increased rainfall due to climate change. On the coast, rising sea levels, also from climate change, squeeze the systems from the other end. Infrastructure, like roads, hospitals, and wastewater plants, needs to be shored up against flooding. Residents need protection from heat and flood water. All of this is expensive. But there's good news for local governments trying to do this work. There are so many new opportunities coming down the line that it's hard to keep track. Michael Dexter is with the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network. He says on top of existing state and federal money, the recent Federal Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act are adding hundreds of billions of dollars to the pot. But Dexter says there's also bad news. One of the major capacity constraints of a lot of these local governments are that they have a few grant writers on staff. Last fall, leaders from up and down the Georgia coast met to talk resilience funding and its challenges. Knowledge of the available grant opportunities. Just partnering. Uh, of course, staff time. Legal review. Getting all the pieces together from the different um, stakeholders. So like approval to submit the grant. And then the last thing, what happens if we actually get the grant? Oh my God, we have to, <laughs> we have to do it. Um, Without a dedicated expert grant writer and plenty of staff, communities may miss out on these huge amounts of money. Nathaniel Smith of the Partnership for Southern Equity says that's especially true in communities of color where old racist policies like redlining discouraged investment and growth. If you look at many of the communities that face the greatest challenges, um, a lot of times people just assume that it happened by happenstance and that couldn't be furthest from the truth. For many of the same reasons, those communities stand to be hit hardest by climate change. They often have less shade to reduce heat, are less protected from flooding, and face more of the health problems that climate change makes worse. The Biden administration is trying to address this disparity with its Justice 40 initiative, which promises to put 40 percent of federal climate funding toward historically disadvantaged communities. Smith's group offers funding and technical support to help eligible places get that money. It takes real resources and time and support um, to ensure that local communities are positioned to compete. Many of the state and federal agencies that dole out grants offer help as well. 
Dexter says his group, the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network, does too. What's not clear is whether all of that is enough. I was going to say that that's the $100 million question. No, that's the $1 trillion, multiple trillion dollar question. Tybee Island faced down these challenges when Hurricane Matthew devastated the island in 2016. But that city got lucky. Robertson, a resident with grant writing experience, stepped up. We're in pretty good space now. We can be much more responsive to many more opportunities because we have identified these projects. While stormwater remains a problem, they've gotten grants to build protective dunes and elevate flood-prone houses. Now, Robertson works with the city to keep a running list of projects to fund. As the wave of new federal funding comes, other communities could use similar help. Emily Jones, WABE News. That story was part of a partnership between WABE in Atlanta and Grist. Thanks to them for sharing it with us. We're spending today's show checking in on the Inflation Reduction Act. How well is it addressing climate disruption? Coming up, trying to pivot from old, dirty energy sources to new, clean ones. You know, the better, cheaper version of a future energy system is definitely wind and solar powered, not fossil fuel based. But we invested heavily in the latter for much of the century so far. That's up next. We'll be right back. We've heard from an analyst and climate justice advocate. Now let's bring in the perspective of someone from the clean energy industry. What are they seeing of the $400 billion investment from the IRA? Danny Kennedy is CEO of New Energy Nexus, which offers funding and programs to boost the development and innovation of renewable energy. He chatted with my co-host, Greg Dalton. So let's talk about the IRA, the IRA, I guess people call it, the Inflation Reduction Act, now about 18 months old. Uncle Bill and Auntie Ira, I've heard it referred to in the Beltway, yeah. Right, the bill being the bipartisan infrastructure law. infrastructure law. law. Yeah. yeah, Bill and Ira, okay. So what grade would you give Ira so far? As we start simple here in terms of implementation, how would you rate it? Good way of putting it, I think the grading of the student is probably a B in intent and, and the first draft or first semester performance, which was the production of the actual legislation was a, a, a B. I think we're looking to see in the second semester, the actual implementation or execution of the vision that was written into the law. And I'm not sure they get a B yet. Ah. So what's going well? What's lagging? Where does the student need to uh, kind of up their game a little bit? Well, clearly the, the Inflation Reduction Act has spawned a whole lot of commitments, a lot of announcements. America, however, has a risk of what some people call checkism, which is kind of writing checks, but never really spending them, you know, never really cashing that and putting concrete in the ground and factories up and running. And, you know, certainly that is the the fear some of us have that while there's been many battery factories and downstream EV factories and all sorts of energy infrastructure declared, we've got other reasons those things may not be made manifest in the world. Interconnection queues we've heard about with solar and wind farms into the grid and other permitting snafus which delay to the point that final investment decisions can't be made and factories may not get built. We need just a quicker response rate and more alacrity from those that are promulgating it. I know it's too important to rush and I understand that, but I think we need to work out how to build things with intent. You know, we get in our own way sometimes. We need yes in my backyard sort of approaches mm -hmm. and yeah. concierge services from state development agencies and people that are in the business of clearing the lines and connecting the dots so that these developments can be built. Uh, you know, we've got a decade to do this work and we can't take 18 months to just sort of get the instructions Right. I hear you saying there could be lots of announcements, but those announcements uh, 
may not always follow through. I think of Rivian, which is a big factory announced, but billion dollar factory announced in Georgia, you know, a lot of buzz around that other things happening in Georgia. And then Rivian just pulled back and said, well, I'm not so sure. Uh, so that's one example. We heard a lot last time after the global recession of, you know, shovel ready projects. I don't hear that term these days. Uh, where has that gone? Are, are we concerned about shovel ready things that can happen fast? Look, I think the scope and scale of the IRA is so big that, you know, there probably weren't enough shovel-ready projects to ah. fill the book that it described. So they've actually had to, to go back out to market and inspire and inset some big projects. And, and that's fair. That's what an industrial strategy is, which our great nation, the United States, is undertaking. It's whether the strategy can be seen through is kind of the question now. But there have been some shovel-ready projects, and it's not to say that they're not doing anything. We're clearly building in places and parts. And in California, where we work with New Energy Nexus, we've seen factories open that are already putting the production lines in place and groundbreaking down at Lithium Valley in Imperial County for a large lithium production facility combined with a, a new geothermal power plant. That's exciting to see, you know, the, the shovel in the ground for that first turn of the sod, but we need more of those, I guess, and, and soon. So big picture, you know, global investment in energy transition technologies was $1.8 trillion last year compared to $1.1 trillion for fossil fuels. That's according to Bloomberg NEF. The gap has steadily widened since 2020. How do you hold those those two things in your mind that both... There's more money going into clean, and yet we seem to be not meeting, uh, not on track for meeting the decarbonization goals that we need to make. Well, there's a couple of levels there. One is the global, where you're absolutely right. You know, we are now way outpacing and have been since 2015, spending more money on the clean side of the ledger than the dirty side. Mm -hmm. Year on year, it's more solar and wind added to the grid than anything else. And, and last year, it was like 80% globally. Not so true in the U.S. is the reality. We've had a a hush-hush boom. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, <laughs> that was what no. some pundit called the gas fracking phenomenon and the recent gas export in interests that have grown in the United States. You know, we don't want to talk about it, hush-hush, but we're having a boom. Largest producers of oil and exporters of gas. You know, so the reality that you described globally is not so true in the States even though we've also passed these laws to try to create new industries and, and spawn this shared prosperity. And, the, you know, the results matter. And last year, natural gas was the thing that grew by a country mile. And generation from combined wind and solar grew a lot less. You know, and the rates of growth of one versus the other are quite marked, and it's going the wrong way. So does this mean that the IRA is not delivering on its promise? And are some of these things outside the influence of the IRA, which is just getting started? Because the fracking boom you're talking about started under Obama, right? U.S. became number one global oils producer, changed the law so it could export crude oil, which was previously outlawed. So we're a big energy producer. That's a good thing for, for some people, investors and jobs, but we're, we're more of a carbon source. So, yeah, connect that for me. I think this is the, the challenge. You know, I don't want to say that it hasn't worked yet. We still have to let it run its course. But mm -hmm. in the early innings, if you will, it's complexified by the fact that we ran an industrial policy as a country since the turn of the century to make gas and oil cheap and then to export it to the world. And, and that's been a common position of all the administrations. It was the confusion of an all of the above energy policy in an era when we needed to switch to clean energy for carbon and cost reasons. You know, the better, cheaper version of a future energy system is definitely wind and solar powered, not fossil fuel based. But we invested heavily in the latter for much of the century so far. And just in the last few years, have been trying to turn that ship around with the IRA and, and the rest. Mm. You know, when you're going to try a, an industrial strategy as the Bidenomics claims it's doing, it has to pivot and be agile, just like the entrepreneurs that are building the factories and, and adjust to new constraints like inflation. The Europeans are now talking about a dual interest rate where the, the things we want in the world get a different kind of basic interest rate from the central bank mm. than the US system of just applying the same thing to everyone. Mm. 
that could be a creative policy response to keep the momentum going. So solar pays a lower interest rate than coal, something like that, right? So dirty, exactly. pay, dirty pays a higher interest rate than clean. Okay. And, and, you know, to keep the ball rolling under the IRA and Uncle Bill, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, we might have to think of new policies and approaches and strategies to keep that momentum. But is the U.S. able to do that? Is Congress and the president going to be able to push another thing into the world in order to ensure that the, the idea behind the IRA sticks? Right, right. And yeah, getting anything through Congress, that'd be a political battle for sure. There's been some tension between should we build uh, solar in this country, and there is some manufacturing renaissance in this country with some people th of solar, which some people thought would never happen. So is it better to get the cheapest, most readily available inputs, solar panels or so things from China? Or is, isn't there a tension between going cheap and fast? There's a tension between kind of the political economy and the, and the global climate. Look, Greg, there's a tension in a lot of these things, and the tension's been created by a century of burning fossil fuels and sticking carbon in the atmosphere and causing the planet to heat. And mm -hmm. now the time value of carbon that we generate today is really important to consider. So, you know, cheap and fast might be an important thing to do, and, and it's not cheap in the sense of not well-made. It's cheap in the sense of low cost, you know? Right, and, sure. And the, the incredible machine that was invented in America in 1954 called the solar panel is now being made in scales and, and, and cost structures that we didn't even imagine a decade ago. And I think the world should take advantage of that. That doesn't mean don't diversify the supply chain, don't build elsewhere, including in America, and maybe blend the costs of the different uh, inputs and, and supply chains so that you get an average blended cost that's still really great for photovoltaics, the solar panels. But, you know, we've got to think about time as a, a factor here, but we can't go fast if we don't do fair, I think is the, the reality. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's got to be fast and fair as we drive this energy transition. You say that finding money used to be a bottleneck for clean energy growth uh, companies, and you've been working in this field for some time. Now there's trillions of dollars. Most of the new investment is going into the clean side. Now you say that one of the bottlenecks is finding human talent. Where is the evidence of that? And, and what's the labor piece of this? Yeah, I mean, you know, we could always have more money of the right kind at the right time in the energy transition value chains that we're talking about, you know. There is a lot more of it, a trillion dollars, as you cited up top. We need probably two or three trillion dollars more in the system by 2030 annually. So we've got to triple the sort of spend rate. But the good news is that capital's around and it's looking for something to do because the stuff it used to invest in is no longer viable. But the constraint now is more the human capital if we can call people capital, you know, talent effectively. You're such a capitalist, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's, there needs to be another million electricians in America to electrify everything. All the heat pumps we want to install, all the circuit boards we want to upgrade, all the EV charges we want to implement. We just need a lot more sparkies, uh, electricians. Where we're working in Imperial County in Southern California on powering prosperity for the inland counties of California, which are fairly, you know, broke in some ways um, socially and economically. The, the limiting constraint there is not the lithium that's coming out of the geothermal power sector bubbling up from underground. It's not the money which is willing and able to invest, particularly with the inducement of the IRA support that they can attract. It's, there's not enough workers. There's not people to stand on factory lines if we build the factories. This is true across the states, by the way. You know, the, the kind of vocational training for production line engineers, you know, the two, not four year courses. We just don't do as much anymore. And so community college districts and all of these different institutions need to gear up for the new skills and, and new workforce. We call them new energy skills training opportunities, which are huge and very exciting. And, you know, this is not to say we take shortcuts. We've got to work out how to do it right. And so we don't have unintended consequences and harm folk in any sense. And in fact, you know, the idea was to do it right and lift people up that have historically been harmed by the other energy system of the 20th century of the past. But if this drags out, the enthusiasm for it, the, the faith in it 
will drain. And I think that's one of the biggest consequences. We need a narrative strategy, you know, the mission economy that JFK set the country on when he said, let's go to the moon and back safely. You know, 400,000 companies were engaged in that, all sorts of government agencies. It wasn't NASA. It was a whole of economy effort. And we did an historic, amazing thing. This is bigger than that. And how do we engage government to enable private sector and, and public sector, civil society to do all of those things is the question. Danny Kennedy, Chief Energy Officer at New Energy Nexus. Danny, thanks so much for sharing your insights into uh, Uncle Ira or in Mr. Bill. Uncle Bill and Auntie Ira. Auntie Ira. Okay. Thanks, Danny. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's been 20 months since the IRA passed, and a lot of the investments from the IRA have flowed into conservative states. Now, as we're on the precipice of a presidential election, there's a lot of talk about how this policy and the other climate priorities of the Biden administration could change if Donald Trump is re-elected later this year. Before we end today's show, I want to return to my conversation with Trevor Hauser, a partner at Rhodium Group, the think tank that's been tracking the progress of the IRA. I asked him how durable he thinks this law is now that the money has started flowing. So I think for a large scale repeal of the provisions of the IRA, you would need not just a change in administration, but Republican control of both chambers of Congress. Even then, I think it's unlikely that we would see the totality of the IRA repealed. There no doubt would be desire among political leadership in the Republican Party to roll back what was a marquee legislative achievement of the Biden administration. At the same time, that would be at tension with the very real economic interests of a number of Republican members who are seeing new factories, new job creation occurring in their districts, in their states as a result of the IRA. Right. It's just a little unclear to know how the Republican Party would navigate those tensions. But the fact that so much money is already flowing, the fact that the IRA is, is working largely as intended means that repealing it would have uh, real costs. And as long as over 2024, the IRA continues to expand the amount of clean energy investment that's occurring, continues to drive job creation, then I think the politics of wholesale repeal would be pretty tough. And that's our show. Thanks for listening. Talking about climate can be hard and exciting and interesting, and it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or a review, or consider joining us on Patreon and supporting the show that way. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Ariana Brocious is co-host, editor, and producer. Austin Colon is producer and editor. Megan Basilio is our production manager. Wincy Shade is our development manager. Ben Testani is our communications manager. Jenny Lawton is consulting producer. Our theme music was composed by George Young and arranged by Matt Wilcox. Gloria Duffy and Philip Young are co-CEOs of the Commonwealth Club World Affairs, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>